Okay, so today we're going to have a chat about cyber security and hardly a day goes by without a headline. You know, somebody's been hacked, some days been, you know, pubs on the world, whatever it is. So, you know, we've got ransomware, phishing. Um, so I guess the the major issue is the businesses you know, need to be trusted, need to be able to demonstrate that they are doing the very best they can to, to protect both employees and customers. Um, and to that um, sort of aim, standards are quite important, I'm guessing. And things, I mean, I know ISO 27001 has been around for a while. We've got SOC 2, Type 1, and then there are individual industries have standards. But just how important do you think it is that a company such as yourself is able to demonstrate to customers mainly, but also your employees that you're taking cybersecurity seriously. Yeah, that's right, Phil. You, how do we know we can trust vendors and partners? What insight do we have aside from what they might tell us or show us? I've certainly seen some companies that work together day in and day out. And then all of a sudden you get an email from them saying, hey, we just changed our bank account information. Send all, send all your money here now, right? Uh, certifications like ISO 27001, SOC 2, are really important. That means that there's a standard, there's a set of applied controls, a methodology, oversight to the program, and all of that gets audited and attested to by a certified body. And in terms of some of the sort of fairly recent trends, it's been around a while, but zero trust seems to be a, an increasingly well-accepted approach to um, addressing cybersecurity issues. Um, do you think it is that, you know, it makes sense, but also is at the moment, it's a sort of, I guess it's an idea where people, you know, people get the, you know, get what it's trying to do, but is it possible or do you think desirable to formalize or standardize, you know, to have a zero trust architecture, or is it just a, an idea that everyone just needs to sort of work out for themselves what it actually means? That's an interesting question, because I think right now, zero trust is a set of principles and the implementation can be really complex. Uh, I think it requires a lot of integration and a lot of implementation um, of auto automation. Um, there's a lot of ways that I think you can talk about it. And I like the idea that we are, we're moving from the idea of trust but verify to never trust, always verify. And in accordance with zero trust, I think fundamentally you can't trust the systems and traffic in the network. I think that as the adoption continues, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the, the US government's mandatory adoption for federal agencies, we're gonna see implementation that becomes a standardized version of it and hopefully serve as a model for others to follow as well. And hopefully with vendor solutions, uh, vendors will continue to prioritize supporting integration and automation to help with that high level of complexity. Okay, and maybe if there's a, a sort of third chance, we've got standards that the zero trust architecture is, is sort of increasingly important. And cyber insurance now, uh, it's been around for quite a while. And I know, I mean, even in the dare I say, in the early days of the internet, when you know, people were doing business online, and if you know, they got some downtime, they try to get some compensation off their you know, ISP or whatever it was. So that's, I guess that was a type of cyber insurance, but, but more commonly, I guess it's you know, trying to cover yourself against you know, attacks and, and costs and reputation, down, et cetera. But it's a very complicated area, I'm thinking, because obviously the, the people doing the insurance don't want a, you know, an open-ended liability. You know, somebody's mm -hmm. website goes down or a whole load of data is compromised. What, what cost is that? So can you give us some idea, if, if it's possible, where we are with cyber insurance? You know, is it, is it well regulated and well understood now? Is it still a little bit tricky to, to you know, get yourself cyber insurance or to, you know, customers to feel comfortable that you know they are protected dealing with some you know a vendor such as yourself it's an interesting question i think it's still a little bit tricky to go through the process of getting uh cyber insurance watching the evolution of cyber insurance over the past few years has been interesting you know to your point it has been around a long time um, but really kind of became prominent you know due to theft of personal data business information trade secrets intellectual property What's really interesting now is applying cyber insurance to situations like ransomware and extortion. This has caused some challenges and, and changes, including the rising premiums and some concern as to whether or not you'd get paid if you were the victim of, of uh, ransomware or extortion. So insurance companies, I think, are still struggling. 
struggling with the question of, you know, how do you evaluate an organization, understand if they're secure, you know, should you provide the policy, is there a standard that we can follow? I think in some cases, the way that they're dealing with this is by requiring third party assessments. And uh, I've even heard in some cases, in, in the event of a ransomware, insurance companies are requiring their own negotiation teams to get involved. So pretty interesting to see those developments. But I think the insurance companies are evolving quickly. Uh, I think the data set is, is growing rapidly to help that decision making, encourage disruption in the space and lead to some kind of standardization. Okay, so it, it would appear in, in sort of some ways that sort of third party validation, whether you can point to a set of standards that you have you know, achieved and, and you know, sort of sign up to, um, you can demonstrate that somebody's happy to insure you against liabilities. Um, is that um, sort of table stakes these days or can companies kind of wing it and say, yeah, we take cybersecurity seriously, but we don't have, you know, ISO 27001, but trust us, we know what we're doing. Or, or do you think you do have to demonstrate, I say, with some standards and, and maybe some cyber insurance that you know, you're serious when it comes to looking after your customers' information? It's still a little bit of both. And the certifications do certainly help. Uh, you know, third-party validation is increasingly important, but also, you know, part of the challenge, how do you confidently validate security? Certifications, like I mentioned, are really great, but there's some other tools out there that can help with that. There's some great third-party risk management tools that help with organizational cybersecurity scoring that can provide some good benchmarks. And in terms, I mean, the, the crown jewels still seem to, well, I won't say still, but the importance of data is just growing day on day and the quantities out there. So customer data are crown jewels that need to be protected. Um, and I, I don't know, I mean, do you think most people customer-wise, whether anecdotally or I don't know if you've looked at it, are comfortable with, in general, that they, they trust their, um, you know, their vendors, that they're, they're doing the right thing or, or are they a little bit nervous and is there a bit of a pushback? I, I'm just interested what your thoughts mm. are as to, mm. you know, we're all encouraged to share all our data, obviously, because it's great and, you know, we get all these incentives to do so. But, you know, are we right to trust the people that are asking for the data or is it a state still a little bit of a, a gray area? Yeah, I would <clears throat> certainly encourage everyone to be skeptical about anyone that has their data. Um, you know, going back to the idea of zero trust, you know, we're, we're kind of in a state now where we're just trusting, trusting somewhat blindly, maybe verifying in some cases. We've got to get more, you know, towards the, the idea that we should be verifying in, in all cases. Um, customers are very concerned about their data uh, and rightfully so, you know, but, you know, if you have a good vendor management program, you know, it goes a long way to gain transparency, help to mitigate those concerns. You know, as an organization, if you're cataloging and tiering your vendors, reviewing their certifications, you know, using tools, getting buy-in as part of that third-party risk management program, then I think you're on the right track. Okay. And in terms of the, the sort of security model, we, we talked to previously about zero trust but there's also a again i i think it's been around for a while but there seems to be an increasing emphasis on end-to-end -end security which is a, you know is a grand sounding phrase um, and i think the last time i looked there were probably over 100 different you know security subcategories if you like so i'm hoping that an end-to-end -end, you know for the peace of mind of uh, the end user an end-to-end -end doesn't involve all 100 but but is it is there a recommended architecture? Are there some you know, good models out there from organizations, vendors? What, how do you go about and you know, developing an end-to-end -end architecture? As I say, can you take one off the shelf or make, do you have to make it yourself? What, where are we with that, you know, fulfilling that, the promise of that? Good question. Uh, I'm not even sure if I could accurately define what end-to-end -end security is these days, you know, and almost, you know, every vendor that you work with probably has their own security model and recommended architecture. Um, the way that I look at it is security is a journey. End-to-end -end security to me will be a combination of an architecture and having the right processes in place. It's having a risk management program that is well adopted and applied, it's getting everyone on the same page to have security involved from conception to requirements to validation. And it's more than just the security team. It, it needs to be uh, an organizational effort uh, where you apply checks and balances and, and guardrails and have co constant validation. 
Uh, I think you're right. There's a, a lot out there. There are too many variables. Um, but when you apply best practices and look at advancing different areas of your security model within a defined maturity model, um, and if you implement the fundamentals well and continually review them, I think you'll achieve a secure end state. Okay, and I'm I'm guessing that the the, the world of um, the hybrid workplace has just added a, a level of complexity during the the pandemic, the lockdown, whatever. I guess a lot of people pivoted, and maybe the important thing was to you know get back online and you know working, and maybe security you know took a little slight backseat to start with at least. Um, do you think most companies have now caught up and worked out that you know if someone's working from home or in a out of the office it's critically important that they're you know doing the same things as they would be or or you know they've got the same protections in the office or do you think there are still a, a lot of people that have sort of started in the hybrid world during the pandemic and haven't really worked out that if you're using you know somebody at home's using just their you know their own little router and, mm -hmm. and, and network they may, may well be quite a you know a vulnerable backdoor into the whole organization I think it's certainly still a mix of both. Um, some organizations have really adopted the, the tools and technologies to facilitate remote work and, uh, you know, broadly applied, you know, controls and capabilities that facilitate that in a secure manner. Um, but there's, you know, there's other organizations out there too that are, are still had to, as you said, you know, implement the uh, work from home capability very quickly. And, um, you know, there's still some, some gaps that they need to fill maybe with, uh, you know, a secure edge solution or, you know, uh, cloud security broker or something like that. Um, so it's certainly a mix. Okay. And in terms of, um, we're jumping around a bit, so apologies for that, but you're, you're keeping up with me, which is great. Um, one other thing back to sort of theories, we, we've done zero trust, we've done end to end such as we, you know, we can. Um, another thing that XDR or extended detection and response, again, that's been around, I think, a couple of years, maybe now. Is, is it still a strong trend? And again, is it a helpful trend or is it just a, another way of looking at the, you know, the ABC of security, which, which people hopefully will, will know by now? I think it was a, a great introduction. Uh, XDR is a very uh, important tool set, I think. And I think that you know, people are gonna continue to uh, adopt that. Vendors are gonna continue to build that into, uh, into their security tools. You know, every security team needs to figure out what tools are best for them, or maybe engage with a, an MDR vendor or MSSP, Managed Detection and Response, or Managed Security Service Provider. Um, XDR is great. It helps to bring more data to the traditional EDR set. Uh, no tool is a silver bullet, for sure. It depends on how you employ it, but I typically like to empower the SOC team with as much visibility and capability as possible and try to limit context switching, you know, as much as I can. Okay, and in terms of the um, the end goal of security, once upon a time, I think there was a genuine desire and probably belief that it was possible to ring fence an organisation and protect it, um, you know, successfully from attack if, if everything was was carried out correctly. Is it right to say that we are now in the era that you pretty much have to accept that at some stage there will be a breach of your security perimeter, and therefore? you need to think as much about you know what happens if, if somebody gets inside or something you know is not right as opposed to you know, i'm not saying you abandon firewalls but obviously the people are clever they can get around most security defenses so yeah the mindset needs to be we probably will get attacked successfully how can we mitigate best you know when that happens is that right right i think so <clears throat> the traditional perimeter model it's not uh, it's not working today, you know, um, you know, to your point, is, is it a question of if not when, or perhaps you've already been compromised, you just don't know it yet. You know, there's a lot of sprawl today, um, which means that there's a lot of attack service to evaluate. So we have on-prem domains, we have cloud services, cloud applications, and we have multiple flavors of all of those. Uh, it's hard to get to everything and the threats are just evolving so quickly. So it's important to have that capability to respond. And I would encourage any security team or even organization, you know, to practice, 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 practice incident response, and make sure that the organization has practiced that. So yes, I think it's important to train and build the playbooks with that mindset. That it's not if, it's when. 
Okay. And in terms of the um, the sort of the overall cybersecurity solution a company develops, um, a, a lot of focus is given, and understandably, on the technology. You know, all the vendors come out with solutions, and that you know, bells and whistles and all that. But do you think sometimes perhaps the the people, you know, if we're looking at the classic people process product, do you think sometimes people get a little bit obsessed, think, oh, we, you know, if we implement these solutions, we're fine, uh, forgetting perhaps that, you know, however clever you are, if so, you know, an employee gets an email that tells them they've just won a, you know, couple of million dollars or whatever, and they open it, and oh, whoops, a daisy, that sort of thing, and also then the process. I think you referenced earlier, you know, understanding risk within the organisation. So there is a, a, a very serious need to understand or educate your employees, develop policies, processes, and then go out and find what, what, what's best for you. Do you. As I say, do you think the emphasis is too much on the, on the technology, not enough on those, those first two steps? Well, I mean, I, I think you, you said it in its entirety, right? People, process, product, or you know, people, process, and technology all work fundamentally together. And I think you, know, you have to build your fundamentals on top of that, that pyramid, people, process, and technology. If you focus on the fundamentals and getting the right people to take ownership over them, uh, you can be successful. Things like, you know, you have to know what's on your network, know where your data is, vulnerability management, endpoint security, secure configurations, vendor management. I see these as being those fundamental processes that really revolve around, um, you know, people that can do it, and then having some kind of technology that helps you get it done. Cybersecurity has become really complex. So it's important to start with fundamental practices and then plan your maturity and growth milestones over time in conjunction with encouraging learning and growth on the team, you know, to keep everyone's skills sharp. And in terms of um, end users, when they're looking to, you know, engage with a vendor or an MSP or whatever, are there, is it easy to um, list sort of table stakes, you know, when you're engaging, having a conversation with a vendor, do you think there's a, a list of things they must, you know, must be able to demonstrate, or if you ask some questions, rather than scratch their heads and say, oh, I don't know, I'll get back to you, they need to be able to tell you, you know, what they're doing about whatever it is. Any thoughts as to, is, that, is it possible to draw up that kind of uh, list? Yeah, I think you need to, you know, using third party services and solutions has really become uh, a dominant operating model. You know, in most cases, it reduces the need for infrastructure, resources to operate it, things like that. Um, but more and more of these third parties are being targeted to get access to their customers and partners. Not only does that present concerns for companies, but, you know, if you think about the major Log4j vulnerability uh, that happened, you know, um, at the uh, end of last year, uh, it recently showed that, you know, security and IT teams need to have a really, really good understanding of what third parties they're working with. And to take that one step further, what software libraries they're using too. And then they've also got to be ready to respond to a major vulnerability that might exist in software, uh, firmware, or even their cloud solutions. Um, the stakes are really high. And so defining what that means for you as an organization uh, and taking that into account from a risk management perspective, is very, very important. And, and is it possible, sort of following on from that, is it possible to, to um, assess vendors in terms of the, the people that you know do enough as opposed to leaders um, you know for example what, what your sales might do you know in terms of giving that extra reassurance to, to customers who are going to engage with you I think so I, I like to say you know let, let the data uh, provide uh, help you make a decision so I think certainly something like the certifications help a lot but you know compliance is really not the same as being secure uh, developing questionnaires, uh, building out contracts that have security requirements and commitments, and then using those third-party tools we talked a little bit about. That really helps to define and elicit some of the data points that may not be identified just by having a certification. If you understand whether or not a third party has had a breach, maybe has compromised systems or, or unpatched systems, helps you get a better idea of the, the third party security and what risk you're taking on, you know, or, or if they don't have that. They, they haven't been compromised. You know, that, that can be points in their favor. So there's some great tools out there that can help provide this information and help organizations make decisions based on what level of risk that they're, they're willing to accept. Okay, and maybe just, just as we finish, um, and feel free, you know, I understand if, if it's not right for you to reveal, but in terms of your role at Parkplace, are you able to share with us how, how it's evolved 
and you know, how you've seen the security threat landscape develop you know from where it was a couple of years ago to you know the, the type of issues you're dealing with now I think uh, that the threat landscape has been interesting to watch um, but you know I, I think that it's the same uh, same threats that we are we're concerned with over time you know I think when you look at uh, an organization and you take into account the business and, and what's critical um, particularly for you know for us at Park Place we're always concerned about you know fishing an attacker getting a foothold, an attacker escalating their capabilities within our environment, and then an attacker getting a highly privileged account and then having access to you know, data or, or capabilities within our environment. So, you know, for me, I tend to break it down uh, in that manner, and we train the team to respond to uh, each one of those different events. And we build our, our IR plans around that too. So those are really the things that we're concerned with. And watching that over time, you know, once an attacker has access, they might, you know, exfiltrate data or, um, you know, look to get into a uh, social engineering situation followed by business email compromise or even deploy ransomware. But hopefully what we train for is to look fundamentally at that attacker kill chain and, and disrupt it um, wherever we can as quickly as we can. And, and promise final question, because you've given me a lot of your time and I'm grateful for that. Are you an optimist when it comes to the the, the constant, if I, I don't know, call it friction between the, the bad guys and the good guys? Because uh, obviously, as digitalization gains pace, more and more activities are, if you like, you know, at the mercy of IT infrastructure, um, which gives, you know, as I say, the, the, the hackers and et cetera, some you know, extra opportunities. Do you, do you worry that we're yeah, you know, for all the benefits of this, we're we're giving them a, a lot of easy targets. Or do you think that the uh, the solutions just about keep pace so that it you know the digital world is is you know safe from from compromise? Mm, good question. Um, I, I'm certainly not an optimist. I hope I'm more of a realist, and um, it, I, I'm definitely concerned. You know, it, it, security really is. Uh, a cat and mouse game. You have to be prepared for anything and everything. And as you know, the, the technologies develop and, and mature, you know, some are going to fall by the wayside and others are going to become, you know, those that you can defend and secure. There's always this constant need to keep up. Um, but as a realist, you know, I think it's important to think about, you know, how do you test your capabilities and how do you continue to improve them? And so, you know, usually what I'd say is, uh, you know, continuing to test our organization through penetration tests, you know, full scope penetration tests, and then training the team too. Um, looking at those newest attacker techniques through exercises like purple team exercise, um, you know, good training, those will keep us sharp, those will keep us on our toes, and those will keep us uh, prepared and effective, I think. Okay, well, as I say, it's been great to chat to you, John, and thanks for, for the um, the input you've given some some great insights. So appreciate your time. Thanks again. Absolutely, Phil. It's been a pleasure.